Hello, I'm Purnima Shah, a faculty with the Duke Dance Program. I welcome you to the special event, Waters to Water Between You and Flow, that is a part of the Master of Fine Arts in Dance Embodied Interdisciplinary Praxis Spring Dance Series. This creative work is directed and choreographed by Courtney Liu, contributing towards her MFA thesis, Body Image, Ballet Pedagogy, and Flow You, Pedagogical Recommendations to Mitigate Self-Objectification and Choreographic Processes to Move Towards Embodied Flow States. This exceptional research opens up several investigative questions that are at the heart of ballet training, body image and health, and pedagogical recommendations in the 21st century. With great pride, I introduce Courtney Liu this evening. Courtney Liu is a performer, dance maker, and teacher currently pursuing her Master of Fine Arts in Dance at Duke University. Courtney's choreography embraces somatic listening, whole embodiment, and engaged artistic flow states that is amply uh, reflected in her teaching. Her pedagogical research expo explores strategies for reducing self-objectification in the dance classroom. This research was presented at the National Dance Educators Organization and the Embodied Learning Summit. Her collaborative choreography with fellow MFA dance peers, Elia Baker and Lee Edwards, was recently commissioned by the American Dance Festival and the National Museum for Carrie Mae Weems Resist COVID Take Six exhibit. Courtney has taught dance nationally and internationally for the past 15 years in university, private studio, and open online settings. She has facilitated dance experiences for children exposed to domestic violence, underserved children across the US, Special Olympics team members, refugee students in New York and Durham, and students from her grandfather's hometown in Zhuhai, China. Courtney has performed with Matthew Bourne's Swan Lake, the Broadway cast of The Phantom of the Opera, the Radio City Christmas Spectacular, the Perry Dance Contemporary Dance Company, and the Cincinnati Ballet. She has served as an assistant director for Norwegian Cruise Lines and as an assistant dance captain at the Phantom of the Opera. Courtney did her undergraduate studies with us at Duke. She is a RYT 200 certified yoga instructor and has completed the American Ballet Theater teacher training program for levels primary through three. She also choreographs and teachings wedding dance lessons with her fiance, Troy Suter, for the company Save the First Dance. Please feel free to post your questions in the chat during the showing. And there is also an audio link available under the Vimeo screen. I invite Courtney Liu on the stage to introduce her work. Thank you, Pranima Shah. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone out there on Vimeo and everyone in the theater. I want to give a thank you, big thank you, to my advisor, Pranima Shah, who you just met, who introduced me. She has really guided me on this MFA journey, and I'm so grateful. Also want to send a warm thank you out to my thesis committee members, Katya Wesolowski, Michael Kleon, and Tyler Walters. They are honorary guests tonight, socially distanced in Page Auditorium. 
A big thank you to all of the creative team that's been involved in this process. Please check out the credits below the screen. Um, Min Yang Cheng and, um, has done the projections, and we have Leah Austin doing lighting, Austin Powers doing the live Vimeo broadcast for you, John Hanks did the music, and Melody Egan did the costumes that you'll see. Also, um, big shout out to Gabby Cooper, who has served as a swing and assistant for this piece. Swing is always a hard job to know all of the tracks on stage, and it's especially hard during COVID, where we have different regulations going on, uh, and she's really contributed to the work, and you'll get to meet her after during the Q&A. Please do stay if you have time. And then last but not least, the undergraduate dancers that you're about to meet, they have really brought their full focus, dedication, work ethic, love of dance to this work. And they have actually been in quarantine for the past week. They were let out just in time for tech. Uh, and so we had not had a full rehearsal in since about March or something like that until tech. And so they've really done a great job transitioning to Zoom, keeping the choreography kind of warm, ready to go in the forefront of their minds. And I'm really appreciative of everything they've brought to the work. I wanted to talk just a little bit about flow today and use states to get us in the mindset for the work tonight. Like Purnima described, I came to flow in you through an interest in ballet pedagogy and body image originally, which led me to kind of some groundwork research during the first year of the MFA, really delving into different interdisciplinary directions and came across, of course, objectification theory, um, which was actually created at Duke in the 90s, and that is the theory that um, women are sometimes viewed by others as, a, as just a body or a sum of body parts. And much subsequent research has been done on this, and they found that women who self-objectify, um, and it's actually expanded way past the, these binaries of men and women. It can really apply to any group of people. Anyone can step outside of themselves and be watching themselves. So you're living kind of from the outside in, maybe judging yourself, adapting the way you talk and move um, to please an outside party. And so it, it really can interfere with just living your life from the inside out and looking at the world um, as an embodied person. And uh, individuals who self-objectify are also more likely to experience eating and body image disturbances and dancers are more likely to self-objectify than the general population. And so I thought, well, what are some strategies or are there strategies out there that I can bring into my teaching that could maybe discourage that kind of thinking during um, classroom work when we're really trying to be embodied and really be in our bodies and learning about the way a movement feels um, as well as how something looks. There's a balance, of course. And that's what brought me to flow states. You cannot self-objectify when you're in a flow state. Um, I'm sure many of you have been in flow before. It's that feeling, it's sometimes called in the zone. Uh, you might have felt it when you're playing music or maybe playing a game or playing basketball or dancing or doing something you really love to do. And you're doing it because you love to do it. There's not an external motivation. And you're so focused on that task at hand. That's like all that matters. And it's. You're, you're involved in the outside world and you're taking in what's happening in the environment, but you're, you're absolutely moving towards in a flow of energy that doesn't get broken. And if you're not distracted by the self-criticism or by the kind of normal worries about the past and the future, you're right in the present moment. And so I invite you guys tonight, everyone out there, to just think about times that they've been in flow um, or times that they've experienced you, which is, Sometimes used as a synonym of flow, it's also been described as wandering, floating, and living an ethical life. And that feeling of when you're making the right ethical decisions, that ease that comes with knowing that you're doing the right thing and that you're in the right place at the right time. Related, but not exactly the same. We played with both of those concepts and how they can buffer us against self-objectification while we were creating the work. And we'll talk more about creating the work afterwards in the Q&A. But I invite you tonight to enjoy this, yes, as a performance, but also as the culmination of a research project and to think for yourself, what are my experiences of flow in you and how does that relate? How is that maybe similar or not similar to what I'm seeing and what I'm feeling really the dancers emote on stage and to interact with the dancers through your own experience tonight. 
And to help with that, we're gonna invite you all from wherever you are to participate in an opening ritual that we always do before rehearsal. And the dancers are backstage, they're gonna join us. And so if you'll just close your eyes for a moment and put one hand on your forehead. And just let your brain center. Let your full focus come to the space between your eyebrows and for things to just settle. And if you're able to, give yourself permission to not multitask for the next 19 or so minutes. And then we'll bring that hand right to the heart center. And just feel that space there. Maybe feel your heart resting on the back of your body. And tap into your motivation for being here tonight. It might be a love of dance, a love of art, or a desire to support a friend or a mentee or a family member. And tap into the purity of that. And then if you're seated, if you can bring your feet solidly on the ground and your hands on your thighs gently, just feel the energy of the ground coming up through your legs. Feel yourself grounded and feel yourself connected, even if it's through a couple floors, to everyone that's here tonight in the auditorium, to all the dancers, and to everyone who's watching on Vimeo. We're all connected by the same ground. And blink your eyes open gently. And I invite you to enjoy Waters to Waters between you and Flo. Thank you so much.
Yes, thank you, Courtney. Thank you, all the dancers. Excellent work, excellent, excellent work. And I also would like to thank the tech crew and also the audience members for joining us today on this very special event for us. Um, I'd just like to start the question with Courtney. If you could explain a little bit about the flow states and how it got incorporated into the body image and the body objectification thesis. Yes, thank you, Parama. Um, so it started with this researcher, uh, Satu Limaka. She's a sociologist. And she had students in, the study was done in Finland, write about, it, the prompt was my body. And there were two different stories that emerged. One was one of self-objectification, and one was this feeling of really feeling embodied and empowered in the body, really in the present moment, and also connected to the environment and other people. And I registered, oh, that sounds kind of like flow, like the research that uh, Mahali Chicks at Mahali does on flow. And it did align with a couple of the characteristics. And so it, I just became really interested in this. And on a personal note, it's something that has been a sustaining practice for me in feeling the pressures that we all feel as dancers, perhaps to look a certain way, to get a certain part. We've all experienced that as dancers. And I found that in periods of my life where that pressure was especially intense, I would take the time to find a hallway on tour in my dorm room and just have a flow state for myself, like a moment where my body was mine with the music and it was just me being able to be fully in like the cells of my being really is how I came across flow states. It worked out brilliantly, it worked out brilliantly and um, having read your thesis completely, it all kind of, you know, fits into and interweaves into all your arguments and the theoretical work that you've done really very well. Um, I'd like to ask the, the, you know, a question to the dancers, what um, the creative flow, how did it um, feel in the dance itself as well as in your general practice? I can start off. Um, I, when, um, when Courtney first suggested like this piece and like asked, asked um, just like the general Duke like dance community to join, I had no idea what flow was. I was like, what is this? Like I've never really thought about it, like given it much thought. But after like joining this piece and sort of going into this creative process with Courtney, with everyone else, with Gabby. Um, it was very inspiring. Um, and it wasn't just learning the dance itself. It wasn't just learning the choreography. Um, we had rehearsals where we just learned the, choreo the choreography. But in addition, it was a lot of conversations, mm -hmm. a lot of conversations as a group, in smaller groups, one-on-one -on -one with Courtney to get us thinking about what does flow really mean to us? And I think that was what really made me think more broadly about flow. Um, just hearing like when Emma talks about flow or like when Megan talks about flow, like everyone has different um, ideas of what it is to them. And that sort of like widened my perspective of, of on like what it was, what flow is and what it means to me as a person. Would other dancers have something to say? Um, what was this journey for you, like for you? Is this working? Does this work? <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Um, so basically, um, like Michael, I just randomly saw this dance in an email, and um, I was really intrigued because I'm actually a ballet dancer, I have no contemporary training at all, and I just thought this would be a really great opportunity to sort of stretch myself. And coming into it, um, I guess I definitely was, I felt like a fish out of water. Um, I definitely, 
could not get into flow at first because there were just so many moving parts and choreography that I didn't understand, quite frankly. Um, but as we sort of went along with the process and I sort of really let myself go um, and move with the other dancers and really feel the energy of the space, um, I was able to feel more vulnerable with myself and um, it was a really great experience to sort of dance with more intention while also not even really being, not really even having to force myself to think um, sort of about like the presentation of it all. So I have a question from the audience members. How might you delineate self-objectification which has a negative connotation and self-awareness which has a positive connotation? Thank you so much for that question from the audience. That's huge. And I briefly mentioned in the speech, but uh, have to be really careful in this research not to demonize self-objectification too much. We're trying to get a good balance, and it's when it gets out of balance that the eating and body disturbances tend to also get high. And in terms of self-objectification, the, the research it came out of was specifically women's studies research um, on self-objectification and really living your life as a being for men's consumption. That was the original theory. It can be expanded. I don't use it in that narrow of a frame, but that was the original theory. This feeling that you're not really a human being, you're really here for someone else's visual consumption, um, which is how, very different than self-awareness, which encompasses the whole human, which encompasses your, uh, your ethics, uh, the way you treat other people, your emotions, your whole humanity, having a self-awareness of your whole humanity and it, that relationship to others and the environment and your impact and the self-objectification would be more narrow in reducing yourself really to a kind of object, literally, for someone else's consumption um, in some way is, is how I would separate the two, but also wanna be really careful because in ballet training, you do have to be able to step out and dance training, all dance training, any kind of physical training. You do have to be able to step outside yourself and visualize your body. That is a skill set that dancers learn and have to learn. And, and we've been challenged by that as dancers in the process of I need I need to be in my body moving, but I also need to make sure my arm is here, not here, so I don't hit the person next to me. You know, So there's, there's definitely a balance there. So one of the audience members is asking if you can talk a little bit about the projections and your collaboration with the projections. Yes, um, Min Yang and I met, gosh, a couple, I don't know how long ago, over winter break, I think it was. And Min Young is in the MFA in Experimental Documentary Arts, and she's back there with her assistant, Zay Tao, and they've done an incredible job. Uh, and when Min Young and I first, first started talking, it was really the ideas that we were really interested in that were similar, uh, this idea of flow, and really what kind of nailed it home that we had to work together on this is I was working on a few works before this that I'll talk a little bit more on Friday. And they had these improvisational scores and they involved sand and bubbles and water and these different kind of very vivid, vivid images that dancers would follow. And when I saw Min Young's work, she had bubbles, she had sand, she had water. And I thought, oh, this has to happen. We have to work together and have this this visual, this interactive, the camera that you see in front of me, it's picking up the dancer's movements and moving the projections. And I just thought that's such a great way to have this feeling of liveness, this improvisatory nature of the piece and have something for the dancers to really play with on stage. I think the projections really project what is unspoken about flow and it, it, it immediately draws out the backdrop, immediately draws out meaning from what is happening on stage without even any explanation. It really works, gels very well with the work. So thank you, Min Yong, and thank you for your collaboration. So one other question is curious to hear more about the flow and performance. 
how the addition of the audience and the setting of the proscenium shifts the flow. Do any of the dancers want to take that up? Or Gabby, if you want to take that up? How can, the audience is here? I can take it. Is this on? OK, beautiful. So um, in high school, we always talked about improv as in being in the improv. And so whenever I dance, I would be like, am I in? Am I? But the moment I was like, I'm in, then it takes you out because you start thinking about it. And so especially for performance, I I always want to be like a little bit nervous or a little bit excited because that gives me like an extra energy to carry through my performance. So I always think about like the optimal amount of energy. I talked to Courtney about this the first time um, I talked to her about her piece. And yeah, I don't know. I read about it in psych class, but it was like optimal energy and optimal stress level can give you a peak performance. So I definitely think there's something magical about being in the theater, especially like, I was talking to Issa before this performance, um, like this show is the first time I've gone to dance on stage in a year, and like, the energy and like jitters that I felt all day, I was like, wow, I haven't had this in so long, and now I'm not like hedonically adapted to it, it's like new again, because I remember like the last time I performed, it was like dance concert at my high school, and we had had like seven shows in a row, and by the end, well, I was a senior, so I was like relishing it and everything, but like at some point in the show, I was like, okay, I've done this dance like 8,000 times at this point. It's like kind of getting stale, and so that's when the audience comes in. It's like after you've rehearsed it to death, then they bring you just like new energy and new life, and it definitely like helps get into flow. Thank you so much. Would other dancers have any comments, personal comments on the work sure. they've done? Sure, yeah, I can um, take that a little bit too. So moving. Moving from flow within the studio to flow within the stage is certainly a different experience for me. Um, yes, there's the stage, which is different. There's the lights, which are disorienting. There's the temperature change, but it's the focus of the people watching you, whether they're here in the uh, theater with us or whether they're watching the live stream at home. It's the knowledge of those eyes watching that tends to disorient, at least me. And as a senior who's about to graduate and is working, is wants to work with dance farther, I need to figure out how to adapt to that. And I agree with what Emma said completely that this was kind of first time performing in such a long time and it seemed new and it was just as energizing, but bringing flow to this, bringing that state of mind where I'm completely in it, and I'm working on grounding myself and shutting off all those thoughts like, oh, what is, what is the person at home gonna think of this section of the dance? No, this is me time. This is, this is my dance, this is our dance on the stage. And just staying within flow in that moment and still experiencing the magic of performing with this group of people is a wonderful experience. Thank you. So this question is very much segueing into what you already said, is much of the language you use in describing the experience of flow is centered in the self. And yet, the energy of the piece felt so expansive outside of the self. How do you balance the internalization and the external energy in the flow states? It's an excellent question. That's a beautiful question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Beautifully rewarded. You must be a dancer. Yes, someone out there is a dancer, a choreographer, <laughs> artist of some kind. But this has been something that's come up in, I've been having these flow chats for about a year. I started with my MFA cohort last summer and continued with the dancers that you've met tonight. And there's this individual flow and collective flow. And when, they can hap when a collective flow can happen and everyone can still be their full individual selves seems to be kind of this top magical moment, those magical moments that people really remember. And so in the context of the piece, in, in creating the work, I wanted to bring both of those elements to the process. And I, I'm glad to hear that it came in through the actual work, um, the, the visual work. So that's why we would have the individual flow chats so that dancers would really have a chance. We could talk one-on-one, -on -one, 
about what, what their experience was, and I made sure that each dancer had a moment to shine, had a solo that was crafted specifically for them based on their flow experiences. And so that was there for every dancer. And then we also did one, I would call it a more individual day where we danced blindfolded for an hour. And um, the dancers were socially distanced and were using like the kind of the tactile nature of the tape to keep themselves socially distanced. And that was very much an internal experience for them. But it was amazing how even blindfolded, it was a collective energy. They were breathing the same air, feeling the same floor, listening to the same music. And uh, we were always having group conversations. And then we didn't do this for the opening ritual, but I'm sure the dancers did backstage. After we ground ourselves and come up, we take a moment to take in the energy of every single person in the room. And we just take a moment for that at the beginning and the end of each rehearsal and uh, just try to, to work together as a collective to build something. Yes, I think this um, collective flow is a popular one. And so this one um, other question, partly you've already answered it, but it's like, what are the potentials of flow for the collective? And how do individual and collective flow, flow states relate to each other? This is part of the research. This is the journey. This is what I'm trying to figure out. And I don't think that the journey ends here. I think it's just beginning. Um, and so I don't, I don't have an answer to that. I don't have a perfect answer. But some thoughts on it are the ideal collective flow would be a place where we are feeling each other's energy and we're maybe moving together towards a certain intention or to, with a certain goodwill towards one another and towards the environment that we're in. Um, but we're also able to be our unique selves and bring our unique movements into whatever whatever's happening um, in the dance piece or, or in life if we want to expand it. I think an individual is not an individual anymore, or rather does not feel an individual within the collective. You just become part of that larger energy. And so even though you are completely aware of your own moves and your own work, but within a collective, there's always energy sort of all around you that is building up from everybody else, from the collective. And that energy influences the internal energy also. And there's a good amount of exchange between the external and the internal that is happening. The body then becomes a part of the larger whole. And you no longer just feel is as an isolated being in there. So that individuality, while you maintain it as a dancer, but as an, as an energy flow, you become part of the whole. And and that is something I've done a lot of group work and, and I've, I've really thought quite deeply about it is that at a certain point that, that collective takes over and while you maintain your individuality, you still kind of flow with the collective energy. So I think we are almost almost pretty much coming to an end, unless you have the last statement, if you would like to say something, um, we, or any dancers want to give a last comment? Um, I'll add a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, I kind of had a unique perspective as I wasn't in the piece, but I kind of was there alongside Courtney as she choreographed it and then helped translate it onto the dancers and I just have to say, like, Courtney's process was just so organic and how she moved from just kind of, like, letting out all of this material and then molding it to the dancers. Like, we took a lot of time in rehearsals to ask the dancers, like, you know, how does this feel or what is, you know, keeping you from getting in flow? Like, like really taking into account their unique perspectives and you know, they're each such unique, beautiful dancers. Um, it was really awesome to be a part of this evolution of the movement, you know, from day one over, you know, winter break, just the two of us in the studio to now seeing it on the dancers. It's just evolved so much. Um, and I think what the process really showed me at least, and I hope everyone else, is that 
like dance doesn't happen in a vacuum, but that it really is influenced by so many factors. And each day is different, you know, your mood and who's in the room, what room are you in, um, just the energy of who's around you, the weather, every single factor contributes to being able to get into flow and how you feel that day and how you feel dancing, how you feel about yourself. And I think because we took the time in rehearsal to talk through you know, everyone's individual experiences, everyone could kind of pull from each other's ideas, and, and I think that just added even more so to what the piece became um, and the final piece. So, yeah. so I think we come to, um, unfortunately, but uh, to an end of this show. Um, I would like to thank Courtney Liu for an excellent demonstration of the floor states and thanking the dancers for a huge amount of hard work and, and wonderful work that they've produced, thanking the crew, and I want to thank our Duke faculty, our thesis committee, and all of the MFA participants who have contributed hugely in making this inaugural MFA spring series a great success. I also want to thank the audience members for joining us today, for your wonderful questions, for very thought-provoking discussion. And um, I end this um, performance evening with a great applaud for everyone who's participated in this. <laughs>